We spent some time in an earlier video differentiating interpersonal communication from impersonal communication and sort of defining what is it that makes communication interpersonal and relationships interpersonal. And one of the factors that we talked about was self-disclosure, that interpersonal relationships involve self-disclosure. They involve sharing something of ourselves with others. So I'd like to spend some time in this video talking about self-disclosure as a part of the self and, uh, and just how that factors into relationships, some of the risks, the benefits, things like that. Let's start by defining self-disclosure. What do we mean by that? Well, self-disclosure is the purposeful disclosure of personal information to another person. So it seems pretty straightforward. It is pretty straightforward, but there are a couple of elements here that we're going to take a look at and break this down a little bit further by looking at some of the principles of self-disclosure. Some of the principles of self-disclosure, some of the underlying foundational things about self-disclosure that we need to know first is that self-disclosure, as the name would indicate, involves the self as the subject. Doesn't count as self-disclosure if you're talking about somebody else. If you're telling a story about somebody else, sharing information about somebody else, that's not self-disclosure. That's disclosure of others, but but it's not self-disclosure. Self-disclosure has you yourself as the subject. Self-disclosure has to be intentional for it to be classified as self-disclosure. It can't be accidental that somebody overhears you telling somebody else, or they find something out about you accidentally or without your knowledge, or you let it slip. That's not self-disclosure by definition. I mean, they still have that information, but self-disclosure is intentional. You mean to share that information with the other person. Self-disclosure is also directed at another person. Uh, it's not just shouted into the ether. You're not just talking to your pet or, you're, you know, you're talking to your dog and somebody overhears. Again, it has to be intentional. It has to be directed at another person. It's not self-disclosure if you're writing it in your journal with the expectation that nobody will, will read it. Um, that's not self-disclosure. Um, that's, that's, you know, again, they have that information, this disclosure, but it's not self-disclosure as it would relate to an interpersonal relationship. In addition, we know that self-disclosure has to be honest. Uh, it, it's not self-disclosure if you're telling somebody something that's not true. It doesn't count as self-disclosure. Self-disclosure has to be honest. It also has to be information unavailable from other sources. It's not really self-disclosure for me to say to you, if we were, if we were meeting just like this, it's for me to say to you, you know, I wear glasses or I'm, you know, going a little bald on top. I'm losing my hair with things like that would not be self-disclosure. They're, they're readily apparent They're You know, that information is available from other sources. Or if I'm somebody famous and, and you know who I am, it wouldn't be self-disclosure for me to say, you know, I'm an actor, I'm an athlete or whatever. If, if I already knew that, that's, that's uh, not really self-disclosure. And finally, self-disclosure, the intimate nature of self-disclosure comes from the context. Usually when we're disclosing something and, and engaging in self-disclosure, it's not in a crowded you know, bar or concert where we're shouting out, hey, did you know this about me? Right? It, it comes from an intimate nature. The intimate nature comes from the context in which we share it because usually we're sharing it. You know, when we're one on one, maybe we even lower our voices and we get serious and we're telling people about ourselves. Uh, but that's sort of the the, the context um, leads to that intimate nature. And that's what makes part of what makes self-disclosure have that sense of intimacy is that that's shared in those types of environments and contexts. There are a couple of ways that we look at self-disclosure. I want to take a look at a couple of models of self-disclosure. Let me note, first of all, that neither one of these um, really has to do with the health of a relationship or, you know, the, whether it's a positive factor in somebody's life or a negative one. These are just ways that we look at self-disclosure and, and observe self-disclosure and, and ways to conceptualize it a little differently. The first one is called social penetration model, social penetration model. Now, whether you realize it or not, there's a pretty good chance that you are familiar with social penetration model. It, it's explained fairly well and fairly succinctly in a very popular movie from this is a little older, but you've probably seen it when you were, when you were younger, if, if you're younger. Um, so social penetration theory is sometimes called the onion theory, if that helps you at all. The onion theory is something that comes up um, really in the movie Shrek. If you remember the first movie, Shrek, the first Shrek, when Shrek explains to Donkey that donkeys are like onions, right? They have layers. What he's really explaining there is this idea of social penetration model. There's a little more to it than that, than, than he explains, but essentially that's what social penetration model is. It's the onion theory, and we call it that because it does imply that people have these layers and that social penetration takes place on a couple different axes, that there's the idea of depth and breadth involved in social and self-disclosure. Right. And what we disclose to other people is, is, you know, 
happens on these two axes. First of all, there's a breadth of information about everybody. There's lots of things to know about us in different categories. If you want to envision it, you can almost, I know it's an onion, but we can almost slice it up like a pie and each piece would be a different part of our life. So there's, there's me as there's my family, right? There's my family. That's, that's one part of my life. That's one piece of piece of the pie of information about me. There's music. I love music. And so I love talking about music and movies and things. So there, I just call that entertainment. How's that? There's my entertainment interest, my pop culture interest. There's my interest in politics and my interest in sports and so forth. All these are different areas of me that provide that breadth, different slices of that pie, right? And then within that, you have depth of each of those areas. Um, and every area could be different. Maybe when we're talking, we talk a lot about music and sports. And so the depth in that area for each, for you and I would be, would be deep Would that, you know, we'd be getting closer, we'd peeling back more layers of that onion, right? Uh, but maybe in other areas, maybe if we don't know each other that well, then you may not know that much about my family or my political thinking or things like that, right? And so the depth is not as as has not penetrated as much there in self disclosure. So again, this doesn't it's not a measure of the health of a relationship. It's just a measure of the breadth and depth of self disclosure in a relationship and a way to conceptualize that. So it's kind of an inter interesting way to think about self disclosure in those. Uh, regards that, that we have these layers and that there's different levels of breadth and depth with which we disclose and they're not all even we don't just share evenly as we go through there right? in one area you may have just superficial information that you've shared other areas you may have very personal information that you've shared so anyway that's the social penetration model the other model i wanted to share with you and, and just discuss very briefly is called the joe harry window uh, it's called that because the people who developed it were named joe and harry uh, so not totally creative, but still the Joe Harry window um, has this as a, at its core, right? This is the window and it has these four boxes. So it's a box and it has these four boxes, four areas within that box, within the window. And the Joe Harry window stipulates that, uh, that it says that people have all these four areas in terms of self-disclosure, right? That we have and one area that's open and free, that everybody clearly knows about us. You don't have to spend much time with this or any time with us at all. Again, the fact that I wear glasses, the fact that I'm losing my hair, um, the fact if you're watching this, that I'm a communication professor and, and that's my area of, of uh, academic background, that's open and free information. It's, it's out there for everybody. It's something that I know about myself and recognize about myself. And it's also things that other people recognize about me. The blind area are things in, in that second box that it indicates there. The blind area are things that other people see about me that I don't see about me, right? So if you were to ask my wife, I would have all kinds of information in this blind area, things that she sees in me that I don't see in me, right? She would tell you about my, you know, that I'm, that I get irritated quickly. And maybe I don't think I do, but, but she sees that and other people may see that, that doesn't take long for me to get frustrated, which is why she handles all the conversations with, you know, that, that deal with salespeople or anything like that, because she's very patient and very friendly. And I am not the second things get, you know, look like they're not going to happen. Then I just, am like, okay, I'm hanging up. I'll see you later. So that's one of my blind spots though, that I, I don't necessarily see in myself, but other people see in me, other people may see a talent in you or a, a key characteristic in you that you don't recognize about yourself. That's the blind area. So others see it. You do not. We go to that third area and it kind of flip flops the blind area. These are things that I know to be true about myself or that I, that I think are true about myself that I've kept hidden from other people. Maybe I'm an all-star singer and you don't know it. Maybe I have this angelic voice, but I don't like to sing in front of people. So nobody knows it. I keep that to myself, right? Maybe that's, that's hidden from other people. I don't disclose that to other people very often. So, um, so that would be in my hidden area. These are things that are known to me, but not to other people. Okay, so it's the flip flop of that blind area, which is known to everybody else, but not to you. Hidden is known to you and not to everybody else. And then my favorite is the fourth box, the fourth area here, the unknown area. These are things that you don't know about yourself and nobody else knows either. You know, we don't know how, you know, how would I respond to uh, living on the moon? I don't know. You don't know either, right? You, nobody knows because I haven't done it. Uh, we don't, you know, nobody has any idea um, how, you know, why am I fearful of sharks? I don't know. I have this thing about sharks. I'll tell you that, that, uh, I have this thing about sharks and, uh, and I don't know why I've never experienced a shark or anything. I live in Indiana. I live in the middle of cornfields and things, but I don't know, maybe it's because my brothers let me watch Jaws too many times when I was young, but, uh, but I have this thing about sharks. So and, and nobody knows why I don't know. Nobody else really knows. So, um, that's unknown. And that's so exciting to me that there are things that we don't know and others don't know about us either. So 
So there are lots of those different kinds of areas too. So each of these though is going to be different for every relationship that you have, though, right? Because some people know you better, like, like my wife, my good friends, my family, my open and free area is big, is bigger because they know a lot about me and I know about that about myself. The hidden area is smaller. Those other areas are smaller. I don't keep as much from them, right? So my open area is bigger in certain relationships, relationships with people that are close to me. And then when we have relationships with people we don't know, like the, 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 you know, maybe even strangers, but when we're first getting to know somebody, that open and free area is going to be much smaller. The hidden area is going to be larger because we haven't told them a lot about us. We're still trying to figure out if we can trust them with that information and so forth. So the other areas are going to be much bigger. Isn't that really interesting? I love the Joe Harry window. Just again, it's a way to kind of visualize it. It's a way to conceptualize how we um, disclose information and, and how that impacts a relationship and what that might look like in this kind of context. So anyway, just something really, I think, cool to think about. Okay, enough with the models of, of uh, self-disclosure. I want to talk a little bit about the benefits and then we're going to talk about the risks. So, but let's, let's start with the upside. What are some of the benefits of, of self-disclosure? We're going to be fairly quick with these uh, and just kind of mention them. This, these are the reasons and the positive reasons that we, that we self-disclose. First is catharsis. It feels good. It feels good to th get things off our chest, right? It feels like a weight has been lifted from your shoulder and so forth. It can feel good to get things out in the open. It can feel good to share things. And it feels good when people share things with us, too. Self-clarification can be a benefit. Um, when you when somebody's you know wonders why you are the way you are and you're able to explain them, well, this is why. Um, th this is why I act this way or this is why I have this fear of that or this is why I'm so good at something. You know, self-clarification um, can, can be good. Self-validation. We do it to, to validate ourselves when we do things we're proud of. We want to share that with somebody else and, and, and also to, to, to feel validated within ourselves and also to receive that validation from others. But, uh, but we express that for those reasons too. Reciprocity. We know that when people self-disclose, people tend to self-disclose in response in, in healthy relationships. So there are times, you know, it's something to be on the lookout for. If you're, if you're disclosing and the other person is not, then you may have to think about, well, is this person not comfortable disclosing or what's what's happening here? But oftentimes we do it because then people feel more comfortable sharing with us as well. Um, inform, uh, sorry, impression formation. We disclose so that people know more about us and, and so we can build that image. Remember we talked about impression management. We talked about the self as well. Here we talked about impression formation and, and self-disclosure can be a good way to help us develop that impression develop that face as we talk about and build that impression in others when we when we tell them about our achievements and things that it may help um, kind of fortify the impression that we're trying to make uh, with that person relationship maintenance and enhancement this is just you know natural and, and an important part of any uh, interpersonal relationship that, that we feel comfortable self-disclosing and that the other person know that we feel comfortable self-disclosing it can it can help with that relationship um, and it can it can just enhance it when we do that. And sometimes we have a moral obligation. You know, recently here, this pandemic, the, the COVID pandemic, and if, if you had COVID, for example, then you have a moral obligation to disclose that to those around you so that they understand that they may need to get tested as well, right? That they that they may need to um, take a look at that and, and, um, and get to see a doctor and get treatment or whatever, um, or at least isolate themselves. So um, sometimes we have a moral disclosure to, disc you know, moral obligation to disclose information. So those are positives. Those are the reasons that, you know, we get the thumbs up for self-disclosing. But there are also some risks when we when we when we disclose when we we disclose to others. There are some risks as well. First of all, the risk of rejection. What if you know I confess to you as we're getting closer that I'm a dog person. I really love dogs, and I'm not really a cat person. But you happen to be a cat person. You might reject that. You might reject me as a result. Right? Might reject because of that information. So self disclosure carries a risk of. You know, when you say you know you care about someone or care about something, there's a risk that that person may reject you. It could give a negative impression along the same lines, right? It could it could give a negative impression of you when you tell somebody, you know, this is my political belief or I, I support this candidate or that candidate. They may think worse of you. I would think worse if you told me you were an Ohio State fan <laughs> as a big Michigan fan, University of Michigan fan. If you told me you were an Ohio State fan, I'd think, oh, wow, that's too bad. What's wrong with you? Right. So that might carry a negative impression. 
You might see a decrease in relational satisfaction. If you have those things, you have that negative impression, you're sharing information and, and they're not, they're not, uh, you know, connecting with that information or they don't find it appealing, um, then you may see a decrease in relational satisfaction. Uh, or if they're not comfortable with the level of self-disclosure, it could see a decrease in the relational satisfaction as a result of that. You may have a loss of influence uh, when you, when you share information with somebody, if they're, if they're not, uh, again, if they're not in favor of it, they may look to you less. You may experience a loss of influence with that person or even a loss of control. If you lose their respect. If a subordinate finds out that you've been lying or you've been stealing or you've been whatever, then, um, then you may lose control of that person. They may not feel like, well, I don't need to listen to this person. They don't have my respect, my respect anymore because of what you told them. Um, there's always the potential that it could hurt the other person. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it all the time. Sometimes that's still necessary, but but we need to consider that. How is this going to impact the other person? It may make me feel better, but is it going to hurt the other person? And if so, is that really fair? Is that what I should be doing? If we are going to self-disclose, there are a couple things we should think about, a couple questions we should ask ourselves. First, uh, is this person important to me? If so, then we need to consider self-disclosure because it is a significant part of an interpersonal relationship. So make sure that person is important to you. If they're not, then may maybe it's not worth it. Is the worth is the risk of disclosing reasonable? Is this is this worth it? In other words, as I was just saying, is the risk reasonable? Um, and if so, then yeah, maybe move ahead. If not, then we may need to consider whether or not that's our best option. Is the disclosure reciprocated? Or sorry, that's next. I got ahead of myself. Is it is the disclosure reciprocated? Let's do that one first. Is the other person sharing back? If not, then we, like I said before, we need to may need to consider pulling back a little bit. If you're sharing and sharing and sharing, and the other person's like, eh, I'm not they're not sharing, then it may be because they're not comfortable with that. And we may need to consider that. The one before that was, is the self-disclosure appropriate? Again, you don't want to get into the TMI situation, right? Where you're sharing just too much information or the inappropriate kind of information. Keep in mind what kind of relationship we ha you have with that person. Is this a personal relationship or is this a professional relationship with a coworker? It's still okay to d disclose in those situations, but maybe not disclose the same type of information, or the same level of information. So, okay. So is it appropriate? Is it, is it reciprocated? Uh, and then will the effect be constructive? On the whole, is this going to have a positive impact uh, for this person, for the other person, and for me, and for this relationship? Is it going to be constructive? Okay. So these are the types of questions we need to ask ourselves and sort of have a checklist in mind uh, whether or not we should be self-disclosing in the first place. Finally, let's talk about what do you do if you don't want to disclose, if, if it's not appropriate for, or whatever. What, what are some alternatives to self-disclosure? Well, one is just silence. It's okay to be silent. If somebody's disclosing to you or somebody says something and you, you're not comfortable disclosing information, it's okay to be quiet and just not say anything, right? Sometimes that's your best option. You could lie. I'm not encouraging this, but I'm just saying it is an alternative to self-disclosure is lying. Right? And uh, you, so you have the um, opportunity that you could lie and just share something else. If you, if you felt like the self-disclosure was going to hurt you too much or hurt them too much, then you have that option. Uh, equivocation is another. You could uh, uh, just kind of hedge and, uh, and and be vague and be abstract, right? And not not really say anything um, in, in, as an alternative to disclosing real information. You could hint, but not really say exactly, but you're giving little hints maybe. Right? Um, but there are, again, we need to consider what the ethics are on, in these types of situations. Um, in, in, in your own personal ethics, you're the one who's going to need to answer that. The ethics of, is it ever appropriate to lie? Is it ever appropriate to equivocate or hint? Or should you just always be totally straightforward? I mean, I'm not sure that's exactly always the right thing either. So uh, you're the person who's going to need to decide what's the best route here if I need an alternative to self-disclosure. What we do know is that self-disclosure is an important part of any relationship. And so we need to consider, you know, how much and what's the best way and is this, what's this relationship and, and, uh, and, and determining whether or not self-disclosure is the best option. And then if so, what kind and so forth. If you have questions about self-disclosure or anything else related to the self and communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you. And in the meantime, I hope that you will be aware of the, your self-disclosure and the impact that it has on your uh, interpersonal relationships.